Good morning, good morning. Yeah, I want to echo what uh, Andrew was saying earlier. Thank you so much for bearing with us, being good sports as we explore just different configuration uh, for using this space. Uh, really grateful for Joe, who's in charge of worship for us, and you know he's been having all these great ideas for how we can create more community and connection um, in this gym. I don't know if you remember uh, what things were like when we first moved in. Uh, we had everyone separated in groups of two and four, six feet apart from one another, right? And so I think part of what we're trying to overcome is that mindset as we're coming in and what it means for us to be church again, you know, and not just an event, uh, but be community, be family again. Uh, we're really trying to figure out how to overcome that. Uh, if you're new with us, my name is Phil, one of the pastors here at Hope City. Uh, any questions about the church or you'd like to get connected, please come see uh, me or Andrew. Love to help you with that. We are into our final leg of our, our journey through uh, the book of Genesis. And so uh, we've spent the last couple weeks talking about Joseph, uh, including today. Uh, we have three uh, messages um, to wrap up our, our story of Joseph. And so... Uh, Andrew's going to take on uh, next week when we talk about Joseph uh, and Pharaoh and Pharaoh's dreams. Um, and then I'm going to conclude uh, with uh, the, sort of the, the family reunion that happens at the end of Joseph for Joseph and his family. So that's where we're going to be going. Um, we can't really talk about Joseph, his story, um, and his experience with God, his experience um, as, as a, a person and as a slave and as a prisoner uh, in Egypt without talking about the topic of dreams. So I don't know if you know this, this is sort of new to me, but we human beings, we spend somewhere between, you know, one and a half to two hours a night, again, depending on how much sleep we get, right, um, dreaming. And each dream that we have typically will last between five to 20 minutes. Although when we're dreaming, that dream can seem much longer, Right? It can seem like we're going through a whole day or something like that in our dream, but dreams themselves, just 5 to 20 minutes, so short. The content of dreams have been of interest to scientists, have been interest to, uh, of interest to philosophers, and especially religious folks as well throughout history. And so sometimes it's important for us to ask, as human beings have asked, what is the purpose of dreams? And there's been many, many theories across human history in fact, for many humans across the eras and across cultures, dreams are believed to function as revealers of truth or they provide a window to the future that the gods kind of give to human beings, right? So one way of seeing dreams is messages from, from the gods. In particular, because we're talking about Joseph, it's important for us to know that the ancient Egyptians believed that dreams were one of the best ways to receive divine revelation, messages or truth from the gods. And so the Egyptians themselves would try to induce dreams. They would try to eat things that would allow them to have dreams. They would try to put themselves in situations where they could have some of these dreams. And so they would go to special sanctuaries or temples and even sleep on special beds in hope of receiving, whether it's advice or comfort or healing from the gods. They would try to induce dreams. They wanted dreams. Dreams were a vital connection to not only what was going to happen in the future, but what the gods were trying to tell them. We as modern people, right, we have um, more recent theories on the purpose and function of dreams. Uh, some researchers really believe that dreams promote the learning process. That when we dream, it somehow improves our ability to learn. It improves our ability to take in, process, and integrate information. Others believe or hypothesize that um, dreams are kind of like, you know, if we see our brains like being a computer, uh, our dreams somehow clean up all the operations that are running subconsciously for us. They kind of remove the junk from our minds during sleep, kind of like freeing up RAM for your computer. That's what's happening as we dream. 
Uh, others kind of take a look at dreams, and especially from those who come from more of a counseling perspective. They see that dreams maybe an, uh, allow the person who's dreaming to process trauma in a safe place. I don't know how many of you have ever had an argument before or, or ha- experienced something scary, and then later on you, you dreamt, and, and that scenario was sort of what came to mind as you were sleeping. Again, there's different theories for why dreams happen. Um, We can't talk about Joseph's story without talking about dreams. And in particular, we're going to delve into this realm where for ancient people, and I think for modern people as well, for people who are in touch with our spirituality and in touch with our relationship with God, the reality that God can speak to us through our dreams. God can communicate to us through our dreams. When we first meet Joseph, he is the 17-year-old favorite son of Jacob, and he is labeled, uh, you know, in not such a great way, as a dreamer, or at least that's what his brothers call him. And he, he's labeled as the dreamer because he has these two vivid dreams. In both of them, whether it has to do with sheaves of grain or it has to do with the sun, moon, and stars, everyone, his brothers, his mother and father, gather around him and are bowing down to him. That's, that's the dream that sort of sets his life in motion. When we meet him today in Genesis 40, we find out that he's been gifted with the ability to interpret dreams. He's not only one who has dreams. He's not just a dreamer. He's a dream interpreter. He is what they would call in Egypt a wise man or a prophet. Next week, we see him take this gift of his to the highest echelons of power in Egypt. He is interpreting dreams that haunt Pharaoh himself. But let's dive into Genesis 40. This is the passage that we're going to unpack today. This is Joseph and his encounter with the cupbearer and the baker while he's in prison. This is Genesis 40, verses 1 to the first part of verse 4. And it reads like this. Sometime later, uh, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was angry with his two officials and the chief cupbearer and the chief baker and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned them to Joseph, and he attended them. According to Genesis, this episode in prison uh, with the cupbearer and the baker, it, it takes place sometime later. And so we need to ask, how much time are we actually talking about? Well, at this point in the story, uh, Joseph has spent over 10 years of his life in captivity, either as a slave or as a prisoner. And when we look at Joseph's entire life, his entire story, we find out that slavery and prison take up a total of 13 years of his life. So if he had those dreams about the the sheaves of grain and about the sun, moon, and stars when he was 17 and he was sold by his brothers shortly after that, We're looking at the ages, uh, this span of life between 17 and, if we're doing math, 30. How many of you here, I'm just curious, are between the ages of 17 and 30? Do we have any between the ages of 17? Yeah, hip, hip, right? Yeah, definitely. Some of you guys here, between 17 and 30, absolutely. I want to tell you that I think these are the prime years of your life as a young adult. You have the strength of your youth, which I so envy. None of you have back pain or anything like that yet, right? You have your health. This is amazing for adventure and sports and travel. You've also got your mental sharpness, which is why the intensity of school and training at this time, you're like optimized mentally to be able to do some of these things, to study late into the night. This is also this incredible opportunity as you are a young adult to meet new people, to take in new experiences, to allow those experiences to shape who you are. For some of us who didn't put up our hands when I asked if you were between the ages of 17 and 30, how many of you vividly remember those times though? Any of you? No one, just me? Okay, just a couple of us. 
right? You know, I think back at those years, 17 to 30, right? What, what happened? I started dating. I started SFU, graduated from SFU, started a job after university, started seminary, experienced a breakup. Then I met Grace. Somehow she decided that she wanted to marry me, um, finished seminary, started work as a youth pastor, had Micah. This is like all between 17 and 30, like all of this life change, an amazing time of learning, growth. So much of life happens when we're young adults, 17 to 30. Joseph's young adulthood is characterized by two things. It's slavery and then prison. But there's one theme throughout Joseph's life as a young adult, and it is this. And it echoes over and over again. And I'm sorry, uh, I know Andrew preached this well already last week, but I have to talk about it because it's so much a part of who Joseph is and what defines him. That no matter what was happening in his life as a young adult, whether it was slavery, whether it was prison, Genesis tells us over and over that the Lord was with him. And this tells us, as those who are hearing this today, that God doesn't remove Joseph from suffering, but he does remain with him in the midst of it. And so perhaps what Scripture is trying to tell us and impress upon us is that in this broken world, where sin and sickness and betrayal and death, all the things that Joseph is familiar with, and that we are familiar with in this broken world, those things will speak into our lives. But yet, on the other hand, those are precisely the moments where God is to be found. He is found then and there to be with us, with us so that he may bring us hope beyond sin, hope beyond sickness, hope beyond betrayal, and hope beyond death. There's this pattern here as we read Joseph's story that no matter what happened to him, slavery, imprisonment, injustice, the Lord was with him. His life was chaotic, far beyond his control. But the one constant in his life is God's presence and his ridiculous kindness towards him, even though his circumstances were far from optimal. And I, and I wonder what this means for us, that perhaps sometimes the only moments where we're able to recognize God's presence and kindness in our lives is truly when our lives spiral beyond our ability to control. It could be medical. It could be a diagnosis that just leaves us staggering. Our world's rocked. It could be relational. It could be a, a breakup that we never saw coming. It could be vocational. You study for years. You find a job that you thought you'd love. And then you get into it and you find out maybe this is not it. It could be financial. And I know we're speaking to everyone here. Just living in Vancouver will do that to us. It could be sociopolitical. Some of us know what it's like to leave unstable countries in order to come to one where we are safe and where we can thrive. In the 10 years that Joseph has left home, not on his own accord, he went from favorite son and hated brother to a nameless slave. He went from a slave overseeing and entrusted with his master's affairs, everything, to being just a common prisoner. And then he goes from being a common prisoner to being the warden's unofficial deputy. And what we see in his story is that every time his circumstances change, God is with him, and he's somehow given greater responsibility to lead. God, God puts him in charge, and he steps up into these opportunities. He's sold as a slave to Potiphar, and later on he's in charge of all of Potiphar's household and businesses. He's unjustly put in prison Later on, he's in charge of the prison itself, all the operations and all the inmates. These 10 years, he's truly experienced the Lord, the God of his fathers, being with him no matter what his circumstances are, which when we find him in this passage, it's currently prison. 
And it's in prison that he meets these two of Pharaoh's officials, the first being a chief cupbearer. And if I were to summarize what this guy does and who he is as Pharaoh's official, he is part sommelier, right, and part secret service agent put into one. This is a man that Pharaoh trusts with his life, not only to source the best wine and drink for the king, but his most important job was to make sure that the king would not be poisoned. And so ancient Egyptian texts tell us that these cupbearers were very, very wealthy, very influential officials of Pharaoh's court. They were not only there as officials in, the, in a cabinet, per se, but they are at the right hand of Pharaoh at all of his meals, all of the social functions, all of the business affairs. And so these cupbearers often became these close confidants of the king. They would wield incredible political influence. And, and that's the person that in prison Joseph meets. The second person that he meets is the chief baker. And I don't know about you, I love pastries, right? Okay, and I live in Burnaby. Um, often, in order to find the best pastries, we got to go downtown or we got to go to the west side of Vancouver. But I'm going to brag a little bit about Burnaby right now because Burnaby, we have Shea Kristoff, right? Some of you are nodding. You have also experienced Shea Kristoff, right? And so we have this like, like, like award-winning chocolatier and, 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 and pastry maker like right here in Burnaby. Amazing, amazing, amazing. This is like the chief baker. He is in charge of the bread and cakes that appear on Pharaoh's table. And, and you and I might ask, how can Shea Kristoff, right, um, you know, plot against Pharaoh? Did he just make a cake that Pharaoh did not like? You know, I want to remind you, I don't know if you see this. Yes, that's right. That's, that's a little bit of some of our culture and heritage if we come from a Chinese background. But I wanted to show you this mooncake thing, right, or the mooncake, because if you know the story, it's not just you know, during mid-autumn festival that we, we eat this, right? And it's not just because it's a, it's a wonderful pastry that pairs very well with bitter tea, but this is something that the revolutionaries actually used to overthrow the Yuan dynasty. It, they carried secret messages that were printed on the surface of the cake itself. And, and if, if a secret message is carried through a cake, it could so easily and deliciously be disposed of. You know, you wouldn't be caught with the message itself, right? You could, you could carry and spread the message, kill the rulers, you know, through these cakes. And that's what they did. And so here we have the chief baker, the chief cupbearer. They had close access to Pharaoh. And if there's a conspiracy against Pharaoh, they could easily play a role. Back to the story, we, we don't know what the charges are, but we, we find out in this passage that the charges were not minor, right? This was not just like, you know, the chief cupbearer brought the wrong vintage to Pharaoh, right? This was not just, you know, I wanted chocolate, but I got strawberry instead, and off you go to prison. That's not the reason. Genesis tells us that they offended Pharaoh, not in a culinary sense, but the Hebrew word for for, you know, that's translated as offended, is the word for sin. This was not Pharaoh being petty or offended at, at food being not up to quality, and he just decides to throw these guys into prison. There's, there's a justified reason why he's holding them in prison right now. And Genesis says that these charges against them are serious, they're justified, and, and that's just juxtaposed against Joseph's imprisonment which is totally unjustified. So something serious must have happened. There must have been some sort of plot to harm the king or overthrow him, and the plot's foiled. And now it's these two guys who are being held while this investigation is taking place. And I'm guessing it had to do with some, some type of poisoning. Was he poisoned by what, you know, was someone poisoned by the drink or was someone poisoned by the food? And so they await the official results of this investigation and Pharaoh's sentence. And while they await, they're in prison. They're put in the king's prison. They're in limbo. They're waiting. They're anxious. They are looking for signs of what will become of them. 
But because of these men's position in the king's court as officials, they aren't thrown into gen pop. They wouldn't survive there. Uh, Even in prison, these men are protected. These men are privileged. They're assigned to the same unit where Joseph is in prison, uh, where the king's prisoners are held. And because of their importance to Pharaoh and also to the kingdom, they're assigned to the care of Joseph, the most capable deputy, deputy warden there. Right? And so this leaves us with a sense of hopefulness as we read this. Will these men who are well-connected somehow be able to help Joseph? They're powerful. They're part of the king's cabinet. They have the king's ear. If Joseph is able to help them, will they be able to help Joseph? Maybe this is Joseph's big break. The story goes on. This is verses 4, the second half of that, to verse 8. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night, and each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials, who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Tell me your dreams. See, this opportunity arises now for Joseph to shine. The cupbearer and the the baker both have dreams the very same night. Uh, We know from this, you know, that this is not a coincidence especially since they probably arrived together on the same charges. Both of them are troubled by these dreams because the dreams tell them, even though they don't know the interpretation or what they mean, the fact that they have dreams tell them that Pharaoh will soon hand down a verdict concerning them. And so the stakes are high. This is a matter of life and death for them. But they aren't able to figure out what their dreams mean. They just know that something is going to happen to them soon. They, they don't know what. And so Genesis tells us that the cupbearer and the baker are dejected. They are so anxious, they're probably not eating. Joseph, being an attentive servant to those in his care, he senses that there's something wrong. And he asks the men, right, what's going on? And they respond, we both have dreams, but there is no one obviously, since we're in prison, to interpret them. The only folks who interpret them belong to the king's court, the wise men. You see, dreams play an important role in ancient Egypt. We touched on this already. Dreams were this means of predicting the future. And and so the interpretation of dreams became this specialized skill that only the wise men and the magicians in the Egyptian court had. Now these men are prisoners, far from the court, far from their colleagues. The cupbearer and baker wouldn't have access to the interpreters. How frightening would it be for us to know that something big is going to happen to us? It's going to happen to us soon, but you don't know whether it's good or bad. You don't know what the king is going to decide for you. These men are overcome by anxiety. They've been given dreams that reveal their future, but they don't have access to the interpretation This is a form of torture in some ways. They want to figure out. They want to know. But then Joseph speaks up. He says this, Do not interpretations belong to God. Tell me your dreams. And I think what Joseph says here is absolutely fascinating to me. Because if I were to put myself in Joseph's shoes, I don't know what I would think of dreams, their interpretations, and God, if my life had changed for the very worst after I had a pair of dreams seemingly from God. If I were Joseph, I might come into this conversation having a very cynical view of dreams or even a very cynical view of God. Think about where his dreams have led him. But somehow this doesn't seem to be the case for Joseph. Despite all he has been through, he still believes that God speaks to us through dreams. 
despite all he has been through, he still believes that God directs the course of our lives, and this God is good. Even in slavery, even in prison, he seems to affirm that. It's interesting that Joseph, of all people, believes this. His brothers didn't bow down or submit to him. They betrayed him. He wasn't elevated after his dreams. He was humiliated and dehumanized. But then he experienced in the humiliation, in the dehumanization, God being with him. So that in every moment while he was being lowered, he experienced God and his kindness causing him to thrive, whether it's thriving as a slave or thriving as a prisoner. God is with him. So in the midst of his humiliation, in the midst of his suffering, he still somehow sees that God is with him. He is holding on to the dream that God gave him years ago, even though he is probably at this point uncertain as to what it truly means, how that dream is going to unfold in his life. The one thing he is certain of at this time is that the interpretation of his dream and all dreams belong to God. It is his right to unfold his life the way God sees fit. And perhaps that's what faith looks like. This, 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 this uncanny ability, this desire to hold on to God in the midst of chaos, in the midst of uncertainty, in the midst of doubt, in the, in the midst of suffering. You know, I propose that Jacob, Jacob, Joseph is able to interpret God's dreams for him because he is able to interpret life's challenges that he is experiencing. That somehow he's figured out that life's challenges are not evidence that God is absent, but actually the very opposite. That life's challenges have the ability to reveal to us God's presence. I don't know if you've experienced this before. When things are going so well and so smooth, it is so easy for us to forget about God. But it's in those challenging times when we recognize we're at the end of ourselves. We have no ability to heal or comfort those we love who are sick that we find we reach out to a God who is present and we experience him there. Tell me your dreams, Joseph says. He doesn't know why he's in Egypt. He doesn't know why he's in prison. But in this moment, he understands his role as a prophet. The passage continues on. This is verses 9 to 15. So the chief cupbearer told Joseph his dream. He said to him, In my dream, I saw a vine in front of me. And on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, it blossomed and its clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes, squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup, and put the cup in his hand. This is what it means, Joseph said to him. The three branches are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your position, and you will put Pharaoh's cup in his hand, just as you used to do when you were his cupbearer. But when all goes well with you, remember me and show kindness to me. Mention me to Pharaoh and get me out of this prison. For I was forcibly carried off from the land of the Hebrews. And even here, I have done nothing to deserve being put in a dungeon. The cupbearer's dream. These grapes that grow. He squeezes all of these grapes uh, into Pharaoh's cup, hands Pharaoh his cup. Joseph's interpretation of this dream is, is simply innocence and restoration. Within three days, Pharaoh is going to clear your name and restore you to your post. That's his interpretation. That's what he says will happen. This is what the dream means. 
This is news that innocent people and people who have been accused of a crime and a wrongdoing that, that they obviously did not commit, this is what they long to hear. This is vindication and salvation. Because being innocent doesn't mean you won't suffer sometimes at the hand of a king. A lot of innocent people have been accused of things and suffered for it, paid for it. Because of the cupbearer's innocence here, Joseph makes a plea. He says, I know within three days you will be out again. You were charged with a crime that you did not commit. You will be restored. You understand what it's like to be falsely accused. Please remember me. Show kindness to me. This, this word kindness is, is hesed. It's the faithfulness to someone, remembering someone. He says, I have done nothing to deserve being put in this dungeon. If anyone understands this in the story and, and can identify with Joseph, it is this cupbearer who is wrongly accused. And at this point in the story, we are just holding on to hope, as Joseph is probably holding on to hope, that some way and somehow someone is going to help him get him out of this dungeon. Will the cupbearer be the one? But before we get to that, the chief baker speaks up. This is what he says. This is verses 16 to 19. When the chief baker saw that Joseph had been given a favorable interpretation, he said to Joseph, I too had a dream. On my head were three baskets of bread. In the top baskets were all kinds of baked goods for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating them out of the basket on my head. This is what it means. Joseph said, the three baskets are three days. Within three days, Pharaoh will lift off your head and impale your body on a pole, and the birds will eat away your flesh. It takes guts to give that interpretation, doesn't it? Right? Just to say it as it is. You see, this baker hears this favorable interpretation for his friend, and so then he shares a dream. Okay, if it went well for him, maybe it's going to go well for me. The cupbearer, if we look at the situation, was so willing to share his dream, so open, that maybe it just suggested he had nothing to hide, right? He's innocent. He had nothing to hide. This is my dream. You know, I'm scared. Help me understand what it means. The baker, however, isn't so forthcoming. He kind of waited until someone else got a good interpretation and said, I'm going to try my hand at this too, right? So, so maybe he's hiding something, right? Perhaps. In terms of the baker's dream and Joseph's interpretation, Joseph basically says, your dream speaks to your guilt, which results in your execution, you know, I'm hung up on this again. Um, you know me. I love my carbs, whether it is noodles or baked things, right? And so what does it mean when, when this baker says all kinds of baked goods were on his head? If you look at Egyptian hieroglyphics, it lists 38 kinds of cake and 57 varieties of bread. Like, absolutely amazing, right? They, they knew how to do carbs the right way, apparently. But he says that not only were all of these different types of delicacies and pastries on my head, he said these birds were eating them out of the top basket on his head. What we see from this interpretation, and again, I'm reading into it, I'm not Joseph, but the baker does nothing to kind of protect the, ba the pastries that are on the very top of his head. Whether this means he did not protect Pharaoh or things getting into Pharaoh's food when he should have, maybe that's it. Or maybe the birds eating stuff off the top of his head is just a metaphor, you know, just imagery for um, what's going to happen to him after his execution. Joseph gives the interpretation as he receives it from God, even though it is not an easy word to say to anyone. But at the end of the day, the proof is in the pudding. Anyone can give an interpretation. Anyone can say to another human being, this is what I think is going to happen to you. 
not everyone gives an accurate or truthful interpretation. And we find out three days later what actually happens. And this is verses 20 to 22. Now the third day was Pharaoh's birthday, and he gave a feast for all his officials. He lifted up the heads of the chief cupbearer and the chief baker in the presence of his officials. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position so that he once again put the cup into Pharaoh's hand, but he impaled the chief baker just as Joseph had said to them in his interpretation. And so Pharaoh's birthday is here. Uh, Egyptian texts mention granting amnesty on those days. There's this term that is used here, lifted up the heads, and it's a play on words, right? It could either mean to pardon or to literally lift off someone's head. And that's exactly what he did. One person he restored, the other person he killed. And we come away from this morbid birthday party knowing that Joseph has the God-given ability to interpret dreams. He is not just all talk. He backs it up. His faith and the gift of interpreting dreams has come through his faith in God that he still holds on to. And so here we are. We see that Joseph is a young man. God is with him. We know that he's full of faith. He still calls on God. He still believes in dreams after all that he has been through. And we know that he is successful in everything that he does because God is with him. And so the question we're left with here, as soon as the cupbearer is restored, is will the cupbearer open the doors that lead Joseph out of prison? Genesis chapter 40 ends with this statement, short. The chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. This episode, this entire chapter, ends with this short, abrupt sentence. It's just a simple statement of facts. But so much hangs in the balance on this one sentence. Years in prison hang in the balance. Two years, in fact. We're talking about captivity, injustice. We're talking about ingratitude in some ways. A man's life hangs in the balance here. And this guy doesn't do anything. Uh, Joseph, you know, being in prison, again, a lot of things can happen to you in prison. He could have been killed in prison in, the, in those two years. And so the question I have as I read this is, is how could he forget? Right? Was it such a wild party, you know, um, after he was restored that, that, again, he's the chief cupbearer, has access to all the alcohol. Was it that wild that he forgot? But what Genesis tells us is that this is not a mental lapse. This type of forgetting is not a mental lapse. It hasn't, doesn't have anything to do with our, our memory. It has to do with our morality. Genesis tells us that he did not remember. And that's a term for saying that he did not act on his duty to help Joseph. That two years will elapse before he remembers to do what he should do until he d does what he should have done. It's as if Genesis wanted to drive this home further, and it just ends with this, that he forgot him. He will not help Joseph out until it is advantageous for him to do so. This is Game of Thrones type of stuff. This is how politics works. This is what power looks like at the court. This cupbearer will not help Joseph until it's the right time, not for Joseph, but for him to do so. You know, I, I read this, and, and this tells me, and Scripture tells me, that Genesis gets pretty honest about how the world you and I live in works. The reality that people will let us down. That the same people that you lift up will let you down. The same people that you so selflessly help will selfishly forget about you. The same people that you help out at work for a crucial assignment may not only just take all the credit for themselves, leaving you out, but 
in a moment where it is advantageous for them to climb, they may even stab you in the back. That is the world that you and I live in. That's the same world that Joseph lives in. It's a broken world. People will let us down. People will conveniently forget about you. But again, I don't want to preach uh, Andrew's sermon uh, for next week. But I do need to end on this. God will not forget about you. People will forget. People will play things, play this game, do things on their own time, do it only for themselves. They will forget about you. God will not. The closing of these prison doors in this episode here in chapter 40 has actually been designed by God to open up palace doors later on for Joseph. But it is a matter of timing. The challenge for Joseph and for us as well if we experience things like this is to continue to remain loyal to God, knowing that he not only holds our future, but he still cares for us and still directs it. And that the dreams that he has for us will still unfold all in the right time. A couple of questions for us for reflection and discussion. Have you ever felt that God was speaking to you through a dream? Why is faith revealed through life's challenges more than life's blessings? And then finally this. When was the last time you felt let down or forgotten by someone you trusted? And this could be just a human being. It could also be God. Moments in our life where we feel like God has forgotten about me. Life has passed me by. God has not shown up. Where is he? Now, I'm sure if you look at Joseph's life, those 13 years that he spent between prison and slavery... There must have been moments of doubt, moments where he was challenged, moments where he was angry. That is the journey of faith. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, um, we come before you. We're trying to see your journey reflected um, in Joseph's, and we see the parallels. We know that you are someone who is not only familiar with suffering, but you understand what betrayal looks like. And you know what it's like to be forgotten. I pray for us as a church that we would be able to discern and interpret life's challenges, be able to see you in life's challenges. I ask that you would help us as a church become more aware of your spirit and your voice, how you speak to us, whether it is through dreams, whether it is through the scriptures, or whether it is through people who speak into our lives. Help us to be people who hear from you. And finally, I pray for those who feel forgotten, those who feel let down. I pray that you yourself would remind them that you remember them, that you will not forget, that you will come through. I pray this in your name. Amen.